There are people everywhere that believe our behavior, intelligence, and personality is merely influenced by either our environment or our genetics alone, but the truth is that our traits rely on a combination of both factors. Nearly every day, we are bombarded with news headlines that tell us how traits are caused exclusively, or at least primarily, by our genes. Newspapers like the Los Angeles Times tell how Parkinson's researchers zero in on a gene, or about a gene defect that may provide a cancer test. USA Today has had headlines such as Mutant Gene Thwarts HIV, and found a gene that controls place memory. Although there is no reason to deny the amazing advances in the field of molecular biology, these headlines are presented to the public in a way that suggests that there aren't any other contributing factors, when, in fact, all of our traits emerge from both genetic and environmental factors. Modern psychologists tend to look at nature and nurture as um, acting uh, in interaction with each other as opposed to against each other, um, whereas in the past, people have tend to have attributed behavior to either um, genes or the environment as though it's a competition, whereas it's undeniable that the two interact together to, um, to produce behavior. Since 2300 years ago, there have been people and researchers alike questioning the origin of our biological and psychological characteristics. There is no doubt that you even probably heard the phrase, Oh, you have your father's eyes! Or even, how can you be so quiet when you come from this family? Statements like these could lead anyone to believe most of our traits are based solely on genetics, but in reality, psychological and biological traits rely on the mutual dependence of environmental factors as well as genes. The nature versus nurture debate seeks to understand how someone develops things, such as personality, behaviors, and intelligence. A good example of what scientists researching this debate would ask could be whether a person's optimistic attitude was formed as a result of the genes he inherited from his happy-go-lucky parents, or from being surrounded by optimistic people during his formative years. The history of the nature versus nurture debate can be traced back to over a century ago, where Francis Galton used the terms nature and nurture to discuss how genetics and environment influenced a person's development. In his work titled English Men of Science, Their Nature and Nurture, published in 1874, Galton stated, Nature and nurture are a convenient jingle of words, for it separates under two distinct heads the innumerable elements of which personality is composed. Nature is all that a man brings with himself into the world. Nurture is every influence that affects him after his birth. The debate can also be traced back to the two greatest of the Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. Plato generalized the Socratic method into the idea that acquiring knowledge required thinking, meaning that we could only know things by virtue of our mental activity. Aristotle, however, took a major new intellectual direction. He stressed that the outside world has an enormous influence on how we gain knowledge, what we see, and what we think. Aristotle said that the mind or soul had to respond both to internal forces and external ones. The American psychologist John Watson was best known for his controversial experiments with a young orphan named Albert. With Albert, Watson demonstrated that the acquisition of a phobia could be explained by classical conditioning. Watson was a strong advocate of environmental learning, and he stated, Give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, in my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to take any one of them at random and train him to become any type of specialist I might select. Regardless of his talents, penchants, tendencies, abilities, vocations, and race of his ancestors. This quote focuses on the nurture side of the debate, and he gives no account to the nature side of things. Genetics are directly passed down from your parents. So if your mom is shy, you might be more likely to be shy than your classmates. Or if your dad was aggressive, you might be more likely to be more aggressive than your classmates. Researchers like John Watson, who favored the nurture side of the debate, are said to be advocates of the tabula rasa theory of development, which, when translated from Latin to English, means blank slate. This theory is essentially stating that we are blank slates when we are born. The only factors that influence our behavior, personality, and intelligence would be from our environment. Environment really deals with your surroundings. So if you think about people raised in different environments, for a city versus a rural area, in a city, an adolescent might think it's fun to go out with their friends and go to a club and dancing, whereas in a rural environment, Students might think it's more fun to go out with their friends and go four-wheeling or fishing or hunting. A very intriguing point in the nature versus nurture debate would be that if environment didn't play a part in determining an individual's traits and behaviors, then in theory, 
identical twins should be exactly the same in all aspects, even if they are raised apart. There are, however, many studies that show that they are never exactly alike, although they can be remarkably similar. The Minnesota Twin Study is a longitudinal study that has been going on since 1979 by Thomas Bouchard. Bouchard compared identical twins that were raised together with identical twins that were raised apart. Each twin completed approximately 50 hours of testing and interviews. Bouchard determined that an estimated 70% of intelligence can be attributed to the genetic inheritance, which means that 30% of intelligence can be attributed to other factors, like the environment. There has been a lot of research to support the Minnesota Twin Study. In addition, the size and nature of the sample made it one of the most impressive twin studies ever carried out. There is, however, some criticisms of the study to take into account, including the fact that Bouchard had relied on media coverage to recruit participants. There was no control to establish the amount of contacts the twins had before the study, and we cannot always assume that twins raised together experience the same environment. Although Bouchard supports more of the genetic side of intelligence, Scar and Weinberg in 1977 and Horn in 1979 have focused on parents who had raised both adopted and natural children. The assumption was that all children had the same upbringing, in the same environment, with the same parents. Any significant differences between parent-child IQ correlations for adopted children and natural children should be attributed to genes. The researchers, however, found no significant differences in IQ. This was very interesting because the adopted parents were wealthy, white, and middle class, while the adopted children were from poor, lower class backgrounds with lower IQ parents. In other research, Wallstein in 1997 claims that well-controlled adoption studies that have been conducted in France have found that transferring an infant from a family with low socioeconomic status to a family with high socioeconomic status raises childhood IQ scores by 12 to 16 points, which is about one standard deviation. This implies that intelligence has a lot to do with the environment as well as genetics. An enriched environment may raise IQ scores in children. I think the most important thing is that um, understanding that one gene doesn't ultimately cause a behavior can give people um, a better sense of control in their own lives. Um, I think the media is partially to blame for kind of painting a picture that something like obesity or alcoholism or um, aggression could be tied to one specific gene. Something like that, if, if that was in fact true, um, people wouldn't have the ability or control of changing their own lives. And understanding that it's without a doubt an interaction between environment and genes, um, people can better understand how they can um, affect their, their behavior and lives. As the nature versus nurture debate further develops, scientists find new ways to predict behavior through genes. The Melbourne Brain Genome Project is exploring gene expression to understand the gene patterns and how they relate to those of other genes and respond to behavior alterations or the onset of disease. The Melbourne Brain Genome Project's aim is to build and compare databases of expressed genes in mice for comparison to human genes. The researchers wish to systematically describe all the previously undiscovered genes as well as to test the functions of the genes. One of the most important things to keep in mind when thinking about the cause of people's behaviors, personalities, and intelligence is that we are all influenced by both our environment and our genetics. We are neither blank slates, nor are we completely predispositioned to act and think the way we do. As long as we keep an open mind to what influences our traits, we will continue to make progress on the causes of things such as our personalities. The precise influence of genes and environment on human traits may not be determined in our lifetime, but it will continue to challenge researchers to continue studying the effects of both factors on our personalities, intelligence, and our behaviors.